Welcome, Telsig community. This is the Telsig podcast. I'm Phil Martin from the University of York. And I'm joined today by two guests, uh, one in the studio, one online. So this is our first hybrid podcast. So this could go either way. Please bear with us. Um, Lillian Joy is a learning technologist here at the University of York. And um, she is has been the go-to person for me for several years for all things learning technology because she just has this encyclopedic knowledge of teaching and how technology should be applied. So I'm just, um, she's our, very much our grounding voice of reason here. And uh, Sita from the University of Sheffield is a learning technologist who has made the transition from teaching and until recently was a, uh, a, a trained TESOL practitioner. So um, thank you both for coming on to to talk about this. Um, just a, a quick intro to the topic. Um, this we're, we're talking today about uh, career development, how to get into learning technology, what it looks like. And um, hopefully this is going to be useful for people either in learning technology, hoping to uh, advance their career or go to the next stage or think about what how they could develop, but also people looking to enter the field and, um, and do something different. And this all came about because of a uh, uh, White Rose Learning Technology Forum meeting that we had at the University of Leeds back in um, February, which feels like a long time ago. Um, but anyway, so now over to our guests. Uh, I'll start with Sita. Um, can you? I gave you a brief intro there. Can you just fill in the gaps? Tell us a little bit about you and your um, journey into learning technology so far. Yeah, um, it is actually quite a funny journey, actually. I came to the UK back in 2021 um, for my master's in TESOL uh, and digital education. And then at the time when I was doing my second semester for my master's, I met several learning technologists, like filling up in my classes and they like talk about project management and then like digital education, something that was not exactly a popular topic back home. I'm from Indonesia and it was not something that we kind of like, you know, infested in. And at the time, I thought it was a really interesting field of work that you can combine your understanding on the pedagogy with technology. And I didn't know at the time that what I have been doing as a teacher back home was actually learning technologist work. So it was uh, from that on, I started looking over like the role, uh, got a job as an assistant learning technologist in the University of, she uh, University of Leeds uh, in 2022. And then now I'm just in the University of Sheffield working as a learning technologist and I am loving it. Brilliant. Thanks, Sita. Lillian, over to you. I probably haven't done you justice there by just saying that you're my go-to person. I guess that's not what you you describe yourself. So can you give us a bit of your resume and uh, your, your your journey here, here at York? Um, well, I think you've been very kind, Phil. Um, I, I'm impressed that you think I'm your go-to person because you've definitely kind of grown leaps and bounds, you know, and, and, and put your own stamp on things as well, which is fabulous. Um, so I was uh, formerly known as Lillian Soon. Uh, so there was a lot more about me uh, as a learning technologist under that name. Um, because it goes all the way back to 2000 when I, when I kind of started my learning technology job properly. Um, but prior to that, I would say even in Singapore, um, so Sita and I are from the same neck of the woods, really. Um, when, I was, when I was teaching in Singapore, I observed... Um, the technologists who were working with us, uh, kind of doing teacher training, but they would introduce us to uh, the technology of the day. So it would be like these screens you could put on your OHP that would project from your laptop. You know, the, the, this was the technology of the day. And I was teaching multimedia, so I had access to, to things like uh, authorware and I could make, you know, interactive self-learning uh, resources, which maybe the average tutor couldn't in those days because they were still using OHPs. I, you know, I still think the OHPs are wonderful. You know, it, it's what you do with the tools that you have. So I think as a learning technologist, I think it's a mindset that we all share in common. It doesn't matter what the discipline is that you came from. I used to teach animation 
right? And, you know, you guys taught language. Um, and it's more the way you approach your teaching that develops you. So those people who taught me the basics of technology made an impression on me and it left a, a kind of interest in technology that I then took on to the next few jobs that I had. And then I finally landed at Thomas Danby College, which is now part of Leeds City College, as their learning technologist, their first learning technologist in 2000. Um, and in those days, we were just exploring um, the acquisition of a, um, a VLE. So those were still the early days. So the first version of Blackboard, you know, was on the market. And it just developed from there, I guess. You know, there's an instinct I think some of us have when you are introduced to a, a new technology and you instantly think what you can do with it for your students, with your students. Um, and I think that's the underlying thread that that kind of we all share really from our, our different backgrounds. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is a topic that we can, we, we've got onto into previous podcasts and we'll touch on here as well. It's like when, when technology is, um, how, how we know when we're actually benefiting the students. I mean, that's, a, that's a huge, um, area as well. But, um, see, so just cause you, you mentioned, uh, I think, uh, well, both of you have talked a little bit about, I think the lines are blurred in sometimes you don't have these very clear cut roles. When does teaching end and learning technology begin? There's a kind of, um, a lot of these roles merge depending on your context. Um, this is a question for either of you, but could, what, what do you see at the moment, um, either at York or at Sheffield or in higher education generally, as being um, specific contained roles? What are, the, um, what are people recruiting for at the moment? What are um, roles that are kind of established and which ones are coming into existence more and more? Mm, that's a really interesting question because... I mean, as a learning technologist myself, I can see that it is, you know, it is recruited more and more, but just in different terms. Like, for example, uh, back in Leeds, we call ourselves learning technologists, but in Sheffield, we call ourselves as digital learning officers. So those are the things that, like, essentially, we have the same job that is to make sure that, like, you know, uh, our learners, whoever they are, it could be academics, it could be students, it could be professional service staffs, like enhance themselves with the technology that we have, as well as like, you know, not being scared about the technology that we have. So I guess those are the things that like in our field, in higher education, were kind of like the trend right now, I would say. Maybe Lillian has different you know, point of view on that. But that's from my point of view. Yeah, I guess um, I have the benefit of hindsight, having been kind of in this industry for a while. And like I say, having observed colleagues with that job role back in the day. Uh, I mean, I, I actually remember being herded into a lecture theatre and being shown how to use the internet and, <laughs> the, you know, how, how to download software from all these different places um, and, and to use a virtual chat room for the first time. Everything that we take for granted now. So the job was different as in it, it there was quite a lot to introduce people to actual buttons to push and how the things actually worked. Whereas I think there's a lot more now when we maybe recruit learning technologists and what we're looking for there's this kind of um, baseline understanding that the person should just be really fluent and comfortable with technology. But as we know, I mean, at the start of the podcast, we, we needed someone else to come into the booth to push the volume up button for us, you know. Oh, which I you wouldn't mention that. <laughs> but it just goes to show that, you know, we, we're still learning. Everyone can learn, right? So what do you recruit for when you when you actually want to bring an, a learning technologist into your organization now. I think when I was recruited for this particular role, there was, there was a focus on accessibility um, because we needed that. There was a gap, if you like, in our team um, to, for someone to focus in on that. Um, and I've noticed when I've spoken to other people who want 
to be a learning technologist uh, who are looking to get into the field, if I speak to them about digital accessibility, they can look at me with a blank face. And I, I kind of think it's very dangerous um, to want to be a learning technologist and not know the regulations. It's like wanting to be a chef and not understanding allergies. You just would never get hired. Um, so the things have changed. The requirements for what you're supposed to be aware of has changed quite dramatically in the last few years, I would say. Um, and that's maybe a sign of the industry that, you know, education itself is getting very regulated. You know, what do you think? What do you think, Phil? Yeah, I mean, two th was it 2018 we were talking about with there was a bit of a regulation landmark there because um, actually I, you can talk much more fluently about this than me with your experience, but it, there was this was the time at which you really needed to know, and not just as learning technologists, if you're working with students and just, just your general awareness of accessibility was, is going to help you, I guess, in any, any career. But certainly when you're at the eye of the storm here, um, working with students increasingly so online, having an awareness of um, all the things that we associate with, you know, uh, people who might have visual impairments, for example, but also just what, what exactly is good practice, what does it look like, um, UDL guidelines and things like that. So is that, was was 2018 a, a turning point? I guess, Sita, this was before that you made your jump into learning technology. So you, you weren't in the field pre-2018, I mean, but... Yeah, I mean, um, it is also something that, like, as a teacher, we kind of have to understand as well. There is a pedagogical understanding uh, because I taught English and language teaching um, was expected to be more inclusive towards, you know, people, especially back home. Um, it's a foreign language. It's not our second language or first language. I think I understood like why it has to be regulated on like at that time. Um, at the same time, um, I totally agree with what Julian said about like, you know, people's like the expectation that you need to understand regulations and accessibility was not exactly there. And that's probably why I had like the upper hand because like I did my masters and they were like literally drilled me over like you have to be accessible you have to do this in my assignments mm -hmm. and that that got me like you know into an understanding that oh this is actually very important you know so yeah the expectation was a little bit shocking for me it's a culture shock for me when I started in you know in the field of learning technology Lily, did you when when this came along in 2018? We, we had a big central drive. Did you have to, you know, adjust your skill set, or was there much cramming for you to do, or did you because you got this backlog, you know, back catalog of experience, you were able to draw on that, and you already felt fairly prepped for this? I a bit of both. So um, as part of my back catalog, as it were, um, I was a JISC Tech Dis ambassador uh, and advisor. So. I used to advise people on how best to use technology to work with uh, people with learning difficulties or dis disabilities. So I had a lot of that um, already uh, under my belt, that experience. Um, I think the difficulty was blending what I knew in a very creative and um, we were allowed in further education to be a bit more gung-ho with technologies that we adopted. You'll understand this, Phil. I remember when you first joined, we, I, I totally understood where you were coming from. At the university, you have to be so careful about what tools and what technologies you use because you've got to think about data security, protection. You can't just send students off to use any, anything that just works for them. You have a responsibility to keep them safe as well. So because of that, that was the change for me. I had to adjust my, I know a tool that will do that better than anything else. I had to change from that stance to, well, this is what we have that will meet 90% of your needs. Um, and uh, the other part, you know, had to be a compromise half the time. I mean, a lot of the technologies we have as standard at the uni now are really, really good. 
But at the time, we, we didn't yet have, for instance, provision for everybody to use things like text help read and write. Um, we didn't have the kind of systematic access to accessible maths creation tools. All this had to be built in through a lot of research with students and staff. So it was a bit of both. You know, I had an instinct about things that would work, but then you had to make it work within the establishment. And that is, um, I think, something like if I had to go to another establishment now, I would still have to learn a different set of, you know, tools that they might use and how that could best be adapted. I'm learning every day. This morning I was learning um, something quite specific. Like, um, I mean, A-level teachers might laugh at us at, at HE level, um, but the students are coming to us saying uh, OneNote's really good because they can follow what's on the board uh, without having to strain their eyes. They have a copy of it straight away. We're a Google university, so we don't have that, you know, uh, uh, familiarity uh, with using OneNote for, for that kind of thing. But it's a great technology to overcome sight impairment. So that's what we were doing this morning. So, you know, it's, it, I'm still learning. I'm still picking up stuff. I, I guess the thing that makes me a learning technologist is I'm not afraid of the buttons. I'll just go and poke and go, you should be able to do X. Where's that button? And, you know, we know we can stretch something. And we also know if that doesn't exist, that it's a bad tool. <laughs> Step away now. Yeah, I mean, def I, 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 maybe it's a mindset that's required rather than anything else because I always quite like that idea of, yeah, I, I can relate to everything you're saying. You should be able to do that. Um, how do you do that on this platform? What's your equivalent? Of, yeah, and you have that kind of curious edge to the way you view some of these platforms. Um, so I, th I think I, I was going to ask as well, just to sharpen things up a little bit for people who might be looking at learning technology roles from a, a slightly different vantage point. So can we track sideways a little bit and, and have each of you describe kind of a, a day in the life perhaps of you when you're um, in your current role? Is there such a thing as a typical day? If there's not, maybe we can zoom out and call it a week or something like that. But what's your what's the routine of your current roles? And uh, Sita, I'm particularly interested, obviously, you're able to compare this to um, your very recent teaching experience. So, um, yeah, do you want to do you want to start us off? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, day to day, it's very boring. <laughs> it's nice. all about like you know, <laughs> uh, planning. Um, because like uh, currently in Sheffield, my main role is that I'm um, helping the transition for us from Blackboard Original to Blackboard Ultra. So that's literally what I have been doing every day. Like I'm uh, planning on trainings, planning on workshops, and then like creating contents, materials for trainings, and then like inviting people and everything. Um, other than that, um, actually things uh, that is almost similar like you, Phil, like, you know, uh, we are creating an event, uh, discussions, workshops, um, or like showcase, so inviting academics to share their practices in learning technology field, or just like give them a platform to showcase about like what they're doing with educational technology and how it enhances their courses or their modules, for example, like that. But other than that, it's very administrative. It's a very boring job, but at the same time, uh, within those administrative jobs, it is very uh insightful from my point of view mainly because like i learn i always learn something new every day for example like i never knew that like board ultra could do this for example like that or like listening to academics do, uh like you know sharing their practices like i have found about this can you please research something about it and i ended up in a rabbit hole usually and like trying to research about like oh i don't i never knew that we have technology about let's say um in Chinese or Japanese or Korean languages that actually like accommodate screen readers, for example, like that. Um, especially now that I'm working with Google Workspace, I think the same with York as well. <laughs> used to be in Microsoft with Leeds. 
Um, I also learned a lot of things, like new things about the workspace itself. Like, oh, but we can do this, we can do that. And then sometimes also like a little bit complaining um, internally, like, oh, we used to have this features in Microsoft. Now we don't have it in Google, you know? So that's kind of like what my day-to-day -day looks like, you know, a bit both of like being bored, but at the same time being inspired. At the same time, also like learning something new every day, but also complaining about like, could have done better about this, you know? So yeah, that's for me. Well, I was going to I'll pass over to Lillian, but I just wanted to check with both of you, Lillian, I think you are, are central roles. Are you, are you deemed as central teams and you would work across departments and across faculty lines? Is... No, I'm working like uh, specifically for the faculty. Which faculty do you work for? It's Arts and Humanities. The best one. That's the one I sit on for FLTG, so I can vouch for no offense, STEM. But, um, <laughs> sorry, Lillian. Over to you. You're, how, how does your How does your working week? Okay, so I'm digital education manager. So it's a little bit more varied, I'd say. Um, and I also have responsibility for accessibility side of things. And I am what we call technology mum for a few of our um, tools. So we have mums and dads, you know, like Panopto mum and VLE dad, that kind of thing. So my week is very, very varied. My day is very varied. So it'll kind of be a comp combination of consultations with people who want to figure out how to do X. Um, and it could be anything from like they've got a group assignment and they want to use something on the VLE, but they want it to be a little bit, you know, they want students to have some agency outside of that, which, you know, obviously you can't easily do within the VLE. So the, there's there's quite a lot of sometimes negotiation uh, around a particular use case. Then like today, um, I've had a consultation about uh, an accessible problem, you know, accessibility problem, helping students to actually see handwritten stuff. Um, and that works across multiple uh, faculties and, and disciplines. So there was an economics, there's a management, there's a chemistry, you know. So so the, the, there's quite a lot uh, around there. So part of that will involve me having to go away and create some resources, kind of like what CETA is having to do. You kind of think, well, I'm going to get more and more of these questions. So as quickly as possible, I want to make a quick and dirty video that I can send out to people in support of and to spread this work as well to more people. So there's stuff around that, which is really fun. Other things I would do that I really, really enjoy is organizing user group meetings. Uh, Phil's helped me out with some of those before. Thank you, Phil. But, you know, around certain tools, you bring people together and you get them to share what they're doing. That's always the fun part for me because, as Asita said, you learn so much when someone else tells you what they've done with the tool and you go, oh, yeah, never occurred to me because we're not always in a position where we're actually doing the teaching anymore. So where we used to be maybe more creative because we had to make things fit what, we, what our plan was, we're busy maybe encouraging others to adopt the tool and actually you lose a little bit of that edge if you don't sit next to a lecturer, you know, and I find you learn the most from yeah. that and sitting next to students and looking at how they're doing stuff. So exciting. So as much as possible, I put into my day contact time with students and contact time with lecturers because selfishly I enjoy that more than anything else in the job. Uh, and and uh, yeah, and of course, there's, there's, as Sita says, there is some of the boring stuff you're answering tickets and emails and you you try and work smart right you create templates so you can just kind of like yeah just send the stop reply send them to this resource and get those things as quickly as possible out of the way so you can do the fun stuff yes i agree with that you you mentioned the word negotiation i'm just going to drill down on that a little bit is that a euphemism or is, do you have, i guess how how much of um the the role and again question for both of you is interpersonal relationships because I, I have this and the ability to communicate because this might be a bit of an unfair stereotype but you get the impression that you're working with 
a lot of subject matter experts who are um, kind of a big deal, perhaps, and kind of have been doing things perhaps their own way for a long time. And um, you, your job is, especially with accessibility guidelines coming in, and there's a, there's a legal aspect to this, um, the art of persuasion and, as you say, let's call it negotiation, must be something that needs to be... I, I picture it as being something that is a really pivotal part of the role. Is that fair or how, how, would, you, how would you describe working with subject matter experts and what are the more kind of like prickly situations that you've been in? You can keep everything anonymous, obviously. Well, okay, I can start first. Um, I mean, it's a little bit different for me. I have two different experiences from two different institutions. Back in Leeds, when I was working in the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences, um, they are they are very straightforward. Like they are, if they don't like it, they will say like I don't like it, and if they liked it, they will think that that is like the most amazing ideas they've ever heard, and they thought that I was a genius. So the way to mitigate and make sure that we have a common ground on that is um, like kind of like putting them into a specific expectation that this is my skill set and this is what you want to achieve and this is what I can do and but I need your help you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. so it's a little bit of a different approach but in the arts and humanities now everyone is just so agreeable so negotiation is more into like you know like telling them like listen we need to do a for example like that but I need your guidance on like how you do things and I will just find a workaround on that. So you are going to be comfortable in your own way. And I can also like put my input to make sure that everyone is comfortable. So it's a little bit of like different approaches in terms of negotiation with subject matter experts. But I guess it's more into like expectations, I would say. Like the expectation is quite different in terms of negotiating to subject matter experts. I guess Lillian has a variety of stories, crazy or fun stories about that. I think she looks like she's thinking about which ones are shareable at the moment. I have swum through a sea of sharks and come out the other side. Yeah. Um, it's all been enjoyable, to be fair, because I think I, you expect that of the job as well, don't you? You know, because you've got the laggards, you've got the enthusiasts. So it all, you know... A bad day makes up, is made up for with a good day and, and some excitement that colleagues show makes up for having someone who goes, I'm not going to do this. And I think over time, you build up this capacity to understand that it may not be the right time for that person to do X or adopt Y. Uh, and I think something I've learned with age that you... You, you push on a door and if it's open and you, you can do the thing, you do the thing and you enjoy it. And if you push on another door and it's not going to open for you, you can go and revisit it another time, but not to throw so much energy at it because there is so much work to do, right? I think a learning technologist's work is never done. Uh, you, you could keep going and fine tuning and, and finding other people to develop all the time. Um, so, you know, it's, it's how you manage your own work. So the negotiation thing depends on whether it's a non-negotiable, um, like, you know, you, you could say a lot of the accessibility work is non-negotiable, but you still have to sometimes bide your time and approach it at the right time for that person. Um, and I always use Hans Rosling's uh, way of thinking, factfulness. If, if you haven't read that book, it's an absolutely must read. It's just a way of thinking that I've applied to any kind of situation, like staff development, for instance. I always prepare myself for the fact that there's going to be about four or five groupings of people. You're going to have the enthusiasts who will just, whatever you say, they'll try out. Then you've got a group of people who oh, go on then, this looks interesting, I'll try it out, but they want a little bit more guidance. Then you've got the people who, I don't really want to, but okay, but I'll do it in my own time, you know, not when you say. 
And then you've got the people who don't want to know. They want the secretaries to come back and do sit in the typing pool and do all their work for them. If you have that expectation, then that's more realistic that you can plan not just one training workshop, but you're prepared for the fact that there'll be people who don't turn up. There'll be people who want the recording. There'll be people who go, oh, I just want notes. I don't want the recording. There'll be people who want a one-to-one 10 times a week. Um, we call them frequent flyers. I don't know if you ever worked for them, Sita. Um, but you've got to acknowledge that these are people. That's what we have to work with, you know? The, the, yeah. It would be so boring if everybody was equally enthusiastic. We'd be in la-la land or something, wouldn't we? So, yeah, this is what makes the job really rich. Yeah, I mean, like, I totally agree with uh, Lillian. Like, the aspect of, like, just working with people, you know, like, because they are essentially, like, um, usually with my colleagues, learning technology colleagues, we call, call them, like, fellow nerds in technologies as well. Because, like, they are also fellow nerds. There are also some people who is, like, being the haters for us, you know. And I think, like, being in a, in Sheffield now, like, being in a different institution, I learned to let go. Same way, like, what Lillian said. Like, I learned to let go that, like, some people will not always agree to what I said. And, like, some people will just, like, said that, like, oh, that's ridiculous. Like, why would we even do that? We have been working so perfectly well within the systems. Why are you trying to change it? And I was like, okay, cool. We'll do it next time when you actually needed it. And oftentimes they actually needed it in the near future. So um, I used to not let go of that back in weeks. Like I used to be like pushing it forward, saying that like, oh, we get to make sure they are doing it, you know, that kind of thing. But I think that's common within the Asian experience, I must say. Um, the thing that I was thinking about was um, before something you said triggered a question that I really hope I remember in a minute. <laughs> was just about skills development and keeping keeping up to date so we have um yeah you obviously you've got your interpersonal skills that you are, that you sort of develop with experience your your knowledge of universal design for learning or whatever the scanning the horizon for new technology is a, a thing that um seems to come up in in the learning technology circles as well how do you guys stay current um with your skill set um and specifically what would you recommend for people who are trying to kind of skill up in the area of learning technology, whether they are coming from a sort of related but slightly different field or what do you guys do to stay sharp in uh, in your the knowledge that's needed for your roles? Should I start first, Lillian, as the newcomer in, in, the, in the field? Yeah, um, I am personally really like to do networking and like see what the online community has to say because... It is very interesting what people are actually writing online. That's why I asked Lillian, like, can you please share me your blog? I would love to read it. That's how I stay current to like, what's the current trend? What's the development? LinkedIn is a gem for me. Blue Sky, Twitter of X, sorry, they say it as X now. Um, uh, those are places where I thought like platforms like that has engaging discussions and like what exactly is happening in the field and it's very real time in a way that like people just like put their opinions put their comments on like new technology emergence for example and then they started like having a discussions and it's really nice to see like what other people said like you know same way that we are dealing with uh, the subject matter experts some people would be just like oh this is ridiculous and then there are some people who think that like i actually have another point of views you know um so through those networkings through those online communities i found myself learning a lot basically from people and even if let's say they are not exactly in the field of learning technologies maybe they're just like the um you know the marketing team from like some tools, for example, you always learn something new. But at the same time, because I came from uh, like, you know, a master degree <laughs> and research is something that I personally enjoyed uh, doing some research and then like reading some research from journals and then like attending conferences. I really love attending conferences and actually listen to people's thoughts. Like, opening their brain out and then like try to find out what exactly is the rational why you do that you know that kind of thing is something that is uh, very valuable 
in my role and like how I actually, that is actually how I start this role. Like I was just in the research of educational technology and I ended up hooked up with being a learning technologist. So I think like, you know, stay curious within the field itself in terms of like, stay curious with the people and stay curious with the knowledge itself. It's something that makes me also stay current with the development, I must say. That sounds very sensible. And, and definitely, I think I used to do a lot more, well, the early days before Twitter was born, uh, there was a social network called Jaiku, which I think Google bought and killed like they, they normally do. Um, but some of us uh, learning technologists in the day were starting to do social networking and it was a much more pleasant experience because it wasn't full of nonsense um, and you could find your network and build up your social network that way, your, your professional networking, your personal learning network. And then it just got a little bit much. Um, but, you know, I think just following a few key people, if you can't deal with the plethora of voices, finding your few heroes and following them, um, that's been really, really helpful. Um, and, and, you know, challenging your own understanding of things, you know, just because your hero says one thing doesn't mean you have to, you know, follow along, but just following some diverse voices, following some people who are willing to experiment with technology. So it saves you time. They're doing the review that helped that saves you a ton of time. I mean, the number of technologies that are being put out now is faster than you could possibly test out, right? So you can't do everything and you always have to make decisions. But we're at that era where you have to make concerted efforts. I feel like I went through a golden era where I, I just kind of could pick up a technology and just roll with it. And I think there's a certain step up in the level of technology that's happening with, with AI and, and stuff like that, where you have to learn, uh, you have to step up or change your skill set a little bit. So apart from like, you know, knowing how to use, how, knowing how to do prompt engineering to get the best out of your new technologies, there's other things that are really challenging me, like to work with some subject matter experts, I'm really having to um, do a lot of research into things that I might not actually be familiar with. So um, uh, helping to make uh, our studio a little bit more accessible or, or to generate better formats. I don't use our studio, but I've had to turn it on, look at it, close it down because it made me panic, open it up again and know that by the time I open it up again in five times, eight times, it will start to look familiar because I know as a learning technologist, I can learn anything and just have a go. And so we've got to the point now, you know, a student needed a different style sheet on our studio and we've managed to provide that through, you know, I knew how to direct someone to get that made for, for, for the student. And it's, it's learning as well, not just that you have to have all the skills. I think it's realizing you have to use, um, the best of everyone around you um, and, and not feel like you've got to do it all, but knowing how to apply not just the, the mindset or uh, the buttons, the technology, but knowing how to apply the right person who can do the job faster than you can. It's, it's really hard because I want to know everything. I want to be able to do everything. So having to step back and go, yeah, but that would take me hours to learn and someone else could do that so much faster. So it's learning to kind of start, I don't want to say use people, but to, to understand that um, resources include the networks that you've built up, right? You can ask someone for an hour of their time or they could do a job for you much faster than you could ever learn it yourself. So I guess for me, skilling up includes expanding that network. Um, JISC mail is fabulous. You know, all the, all the JISC mail lists, uh, alt, um, association for learning technology. I think that's crucial to be a member of. Um, certainly as, um, Sita said, going to conferences, uh, if you are supported to go for conferences and if not paying your own way, because you really, really want to go. Um, 
And continuing to pick up a diverse range of skills, I think. I'm learning to braille, which is non-technology. It's it's literally just using uh, a slate and, and stuff. Just learning the whole spectrum of skills that are um, there to be learned. It's a really rich landscape. It's very exciting. We're very lucky compared to subject matter experts who deep oh, yeah, dive into definitely. a tunnel. We get to wander the whole cave system. Yeah, I, yeah agree. I agree with that. But they, but they like it. I think that's what the the well, not. I mean, a lot of the supplement matter experts that I've worked with are, you know, got to know over the. It's, it's um, I think it, it seems to be a, just a, a different mindset. I know. I think Lillian, you and I once talked about rather. I'd rather do you know a hundred master's degrees than a PhD. But it's you. You can talk to some people who are fantastically knowledgeable. They have that depth and. The depth versus breadth, but they're very interested in this particular slice of information. But if you stray outside of that, you I consistently fail to pique certain people's interest in things that I was sure that I'd be able to drag them outside of their SME um, circle. But yeah, well, the fight goes on. So Lillian, you touched on yeah quite a lot of one of my questions was going to be breadth versus depth as well, and and. Um, I, I guess breadth is always going to be the thing for us because we never know what what's what's going to come in useful. Braille is something that, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's a symptom of the curiosity that's made you good at so many other things, right? I mean, it's like, it's, it's not being bound by that, you know, what am I going to use this for within the next 10 minutes? And Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm very much affected by how useful that knowledge is going to be to help me help others. So I think my interest in Braille was driven. Now, surprisingly, the first blind student I worked with on maths, so I do a lot of work on accessible maths. Uh, I'm a graphic designer by training. <laughs> I don't, but I'm now doing accessible math stuff, right? And working with her opened up my eyes to what a big step up it was to go from um, just even going to university is a big step up for a lot of our young people, but to do it when you're vision impaired is a huge thing. And I kind of, that really humbled me. It kind of made me think, of course I can learn anything. And of course all the lecturers should do stuff because here's someone who is having to do all this without one of the senses that we would take for granted and I kind of think there's nothing is too hard for us to do. Think of how much she has to reach, you know, to, to, to make it happen for herself. And, but the funny thing is, working with her, she was so good with her technology, I never questioned it. The next person I met who um, wasn't so confident with technology, it meant that I had to know a little bit more. And that's what's prompted me to want to know Braille. Um so it's, I guess, um, when someone else needs you, you have to dig deeper or you have to be more. And, and that's where you grow, right? That's where you kind of go, oh, I thought I could take this for granted, but actually I can't. I have to reach a little bit more to help this, this person. And in so doing, it's going to expand, broaden my horizons and all the rest of it. It's fascinating. Um, and like I say, you know, one VI student needs X to happen for her. Another one needs Y to happen for them. Or it could be about hearing impairment or even limb difference. And until you get to that story by the students and you kind of realize, yeah, we just tell people to control alt delete or, you know, uh, Windows shift and arrow key. And if you've only got one limb, that's really, really hard to do. What's the solution? And, and, and it's these stories by real people that really I, I guess I feel that's the big motivating factor not the overarching mission statement of an organization <laughs> it's the real stories of real people that need to do something that really mm, add that kind of uh, experiential I don't know gives you that depth of experience uh it's like going on a holiday and 
you can see a picture or a video of someone else's holiday, but it's not the same as when you're in it yourself and experiencing it. And I can read stories of how people have worked with disabled students, but when I'm working with them, it's a, it's a whole different thing. It's a full, full color, full, full reality. Um, and it processes in your brain differently as well. So I don't think this, this thing they're talking about skills and, and, and stuff, there is an aspect where you can read about someone else's journey and feel affected by it, but it's never going to be the same as you going through it yourself, right? So, you know, this podcast is going to be interesting. I don't know what people will get from it when they when they listen to it. Um, I know you get a layer of something when you listen and you read and you um, do your research, but when you actually spend time with other people and help them to achieve what something that's that's the biggest kind of um, learning and skills development you could possibly get and it's a gift it's a gift that that someone gives to you by spending time with you it's amazing yeah I mean um, I really like what Sil said about like you know instead of like doing PhD we do 100 masters and that I think Lillian said it I stole it <laughs> I mean, both of you said that and I, it actually resonates with me because like, that's how I feel working as a learning technologist in the span of like two, almost two and a half years now. I feel like this is my uh, 30th master's degree in learning technology and digital education because we learn so much, not only from ourselves, but also from people. Like if I take an example of like my own case studies, like I, I'm advocating a lot for like inclusive design of learning because I myself back like then, back in 2021, 2022, was an international student that doesn't understand what is going on in the digital education in the UK. We never had this kind of technology before. And like being able to go behind the scene and like see that this is the process on how the student experiences were actually generated and like used to be a part of that international community who felt like, why no one told me about this? You know, that kind of thing was really eye-opening. And that's like, if, you know, if Lillian's uh, motivating factor was like actually experiencing and try to be in that person's shoes, my motivating factor is because like I used to be in that part of community and I wanted people to not, have the same bad experience but only the good experience and like how can I enhance that and that's actually my motivating factor for being a learning technologist I want them to be able to be as a tech expert as like you know students from England or Europe you know like those western and developed countries I want people to actually like want to understand and have more digital literacies not only just like buttons download and they like read it like no one like my peers didn't know that we can actually do screen readers for example like that no one ever actually heard the word accessibility until we were in a master's degree uh, or like no one ever thought that being inclusive means that we made everyone have the same opportunities and actually arrange it in the same way to make sure that everyone is accommodated so those are something that I think was like, you know, very eye-opening in my early career. Yeah, I think I think listening to all this is going gonna, is gonna to be um, uh, useful for a lot of people because I think listening to both of you talk, it gives a real, uh, really clear picture of what it is like in the mindset of a learning technologist at the moment in higher education. So listening to the kind of topics that you're covering and the kind of things that you're raising really kind of gives um, uh, gives people who aren't perhaps aren't familiar with the role something on which to hang their hat and think, okay, I kind of get the parameters of the role now. I get what, you know, what your priorities are and what you're trying to do. I think I just wanted to um, round us off perhaps with a couple of um, – any other points that you, you'd think would, would be worth noting here as well, but um, for people listening, people trying to upskill and um, get themselves into the field – but what, was there, is there anything that's very um, 
pressing at the moment. And and Lillian, I liked your point because you, you actually reminded me of the thing that I was going to say earlier, which was this I, idea of teamwork. And I think uh, what's going to be most valuable is not the fact that a learning technologist has to be some kind of all-encompassing knowledge fountain of everything digital, though Lillian kind of is that. But um, it, it's more about how you fit within your, in your team. And it's so great working with, you know, bunch of people who you say oh I know I can go to this person because they know all about you know they can fix this problem that I have and you have enough overlap but enough difference to keep things interesting so yeah that was um so that's something I meant to ask so thanks for um, flagging that but um the one skill I guess everything's just dominating is AI and uh Lillian raised it so we won't we won't linger too much lord knows we've done enough podcast episodes on on this but um yeah, so, so everyone, I guess, if you that's, that's always going to be a good way to spend your time at the moment, becoming familiar with AI packages, what they can help you with, what you can farm out to them, what the ethical considerations are. So though that's um, a massive topic that people can explore outside of the AI um, vortex. Is there anything that particularly at the moment people serious about career and learning technology really need to be aware of at the moment key skills that we're looking to develop and we've mentioned um accessibility and, and things like that but anything that we haven't covered yet that you think would be really worth people thinking about if they are on this career course you want to go first Lillian well I think one of the things that's really um stood me in good stead is that that pedagogical you know, that scholarship of teaching and learning, the pedagogy and being able to have a theoretical lens on why something might be a better way to do learning. I think I think underneath all the technology, you scrape it all back and it's about teaching and learning. I think, you know, that's your baseline. You have to be quite strong on that field uh, I love anyone who teaches languages because they are seriously the most creative bunch of people ever. My favorite people I ever worked with were, were ESOL uh, teachers because you have to be so creative to get concepts that are quite abstract across, right? Especially with language. So that creativity just leads to that adoption of technology quite naturally. But then you'll seamlessly go back to what works. I mean, I'm I'm sat here with my, my phone, but underneath that is a notebook and a pen, you know. I will reach for whatever works regardless. And I think that flexibility um, and, and understanding that not everyone is, as CT said, you know, not everyone wants to do it technology, but being willing to work with them to, to answer the teaching and learning problem, regardless of whether it's technology-led. I think that builds up trust, that builds up your um, understanding of, you know, you don't want to walk around with a solution looking for a problem. We always say that about certain technologies. You want to listen first to what they're trying to do and then use your entire experience, not just the technology angle. To, to solve it um so yeah for me i think you know building up that learning technology experience actually is has to go hand in hand with with your kind of baseline understanding of how people learn and what motivates them brilliant yeah see to anything you can add there i think something that i observed while i started this career and something that i realized that is not exactly emphasized enough when you started being in this like you know in this field of work is that like, there's so many project managements <laughs> like we we work project by project based on like whoever subject matter experts that you are collaborating with and I mean I have done my you know my portion of project managing back home as a teacher you know like you're managing classes managing events and everything but I realized that like when I saw my colleagues who is just like also like starting their role in learning technology, they started to become really overwhelmed with juggling multiple projects, 
And then like trying to connect with stakeholders, trying to manage expectations, meeting deadlines that is often, you know, under time constraints. Those are the skills that not a lot of people are naturally gifted with. Like unless you are teaching, you know, uh, mini gremlins, for example, you know exactly what you need to manage, for example, like that. Like as teachers, it's naturally come to you. But what if you are not from like teaching backgrounds? What if you want to be in this field of work, but you don't have the natural management role before that? And that is something that even as someone who did project management back then, I caught off guard with it because like, why is it not emphasized that I have to juggle multiple projects with different people, with different expectations, with different deadlines? And like, they... They expected us to already knew that, yeah, project management is inside there. But then like, how do I get more, you know, not necessarily training, but more into like, how do I get more guidance on this, especially in the, you know, in the context of learning technology, because you approach it differently. It's a people technology based work. It's not only with people. It's not only with technology. You, you are the bridge between those two. And those are a different like approach entirely. And that was something that I thought was weirdly not emphasized. I don't know. Like if both of you feel a million saying that it was there, maybe it's because I'm new. Maybe it's because of my experience. No, I think you make a very valid point, Sissy. And I think it's not just for people going into jobs on learning technology. It's almost any job nowadays comes with a huge amount of inputs. So obviously when I started teaching, um, they were showing us how to use email. Like I say, the internet wasn't, it was just a fledgling, everything was Times New Roman and hyperlinks were bright blue, right? Um, And Netscape was still a thing. And the amount of technology overwhelming us was way low. Mobile phones hadn't been invented yet. Whereas now you step into the job, you could be getting an email, a Slack message, a WhatsApp, um, a a JISC mail. You know, you could be multiple um, uh, sources, communities. You've got LinkedIn. You've got all these different ways of communicating and networking. And your information is overwhelming and overloading. So you'll get administrative information, which you know you want to store for future use, but where do you store it? Do you store it in your email? Do you store it in, you know, some things live in your calendar, some things. So your choice, I think City makes a very, very valid point. And I know some people who kind of go, oh, I'm going to do everything in, Word, in you know, in a Google Doc. And I'm like, oh, that's, it's like, so to add to what you're saying about what skill do you need, I think underlying everything is that sense of being able to create a database okay so your personal database is going to be it's going to pay off big time as a learning technologist so i tag everything to the nth degree i use notion i have used evernote in the past Uh, i've used obsidian i've used all kinds of things current my current favorite is notion so i've invested a lot of that my notion pages are almost all databases so I can pop something in there, can filter it, you know, sort it any which way I want. I use tagging because I need to find my information so I can help people, right? So whatever random thing I've come across, I want to be able to find it again. So that for me is, as a city says, maybe that that is a key skill as well in order to cope with the breadth and the depth that we have to to go into. And my, my uh, thing about like, being able to find something again is so prevalent that I'll even, um, I'm, I'm turning to the front page of my notebook to show Phil my uh, index. Even my handwritten notes are indexed so I can find that information, right? And and it's got broad areas so I can quickly look in a sub area and find the information I need. So yeah, information retrieval. I think we have to convert ourselves into a database. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and I think I, as you were talking, I think that's probably a, we could do a whole episode on on that. I mean, it's something I, I just you not just yeah, digital overload is one thing, but um, time management in 
the in this era that we live when <clears throat> you have everything competing for your time and attention all at once and it is you know we're the whole economy is built around capturing people's attention and that's before you get to work so um yeah i, I think it's a, it's a huge thing and i think um time management and just curating your own digital yeah repository repository yeah this is a huge thing that we don't really talk about and um and it's so easy to get overwhelmed um true but um i'm yeah we're now on the hour mark so over over the hour mark that was all that singing we did at the beginning and pushed us over but um well i just wanted to say thank you very much to to both of you this has been uh really interesting and i do hope that a lot of people find this a uh, valuable resource to listen to city are you going to be attending any which you go to the one in leeds are you going to be any more in the future i mean yeah i guess <laughs> i mean like i i will be around <laughs> like i mean like i still i still um go to several like events that you know my colleagues back in leeds were like inviting me online or in person and it's really close york and leeds is very close to sheffield so yeah. i'll be around you'll see me it would be great to see you in person, um, and yeah, we'll, we'll catch up then. Lily, are you are you still White Rose, or have you? Yeah, so um, the next White Rose Learning Technology events on the seventh of November on Authentic Assessment. That's online, uh, and then there will be a face to face unconference, not officially announced yet, but we've discussed it. Um, there'll be an unconference where us learning technologist geeks can get together and just share whatever we're most passionate about on that day. So, yeah, look out for details. Exciting. We have a sneak peek. Yeah, all right, that's something to look forward to. Thank you very much, Lillian. And uh, thank you, City. I'm going to switch us off now, but stick around and um, we'll say goodbye properly. But, um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.